Okay, welcome everybody to today's webinar. This is the next in a series of regular webinars that we run throughout the year. This one is on our, on our expert retrospectives, our lessons learned from real world projects. And this was called the Ferrari World Story. We're gonna learn about the project that designed and built Far Ferrari World, one of the world's largest theme parks. Uh, on the call, we have Phil Richardson, who is in charge of that project. Phil, welcome, take it away. Thank you very much, Kevin. I appreciate it. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of sharing with you the fascinating experience I had with leading the design and delivery team for Ferrari World in Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates. I will describe for you my use of the Agile project management system to gain an advantage over the traditional waterfall method. And it worked very well for us with this mega project. And you will soon learn that Agile can be applied to projects of any size. Opened in 2010, in 2019, IAPA, the Global Theme Park Industry Association, voted it the best theme park in the world. Um, it, um, Ferrari World is uh, located in Abu Dhabi. It's just not just the largest indoor theme park on planet Earth. It pays tribute to the iconic Italian automaker. And it's the world's first Ferrari branded theme park. It offers a range of thrilling rides and attractions of for all ages. But Ferrari World is more than just an amusement park. It is a celebration of Ferrari brands, heritage and innovation. As Simon Sinek would say, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And the why behind Ferrari World is to bring the Ferrari brand to life in an unforgettable way. As you can see from this view from a satellite, <laughs> yes, from space, it's a 2 million square foot, $2.5 billion theme park. And it's integrated, you'll note beside it, with the 3 million square foot, $3 billion USD super regional mall in Abu Dhabi, UAE. So how did we do it? It was so satisfying to deliver it on time and on budget. It was a unique challenge, which we met by applying agile project management values, principles, and systems. Kevin, if you'd toggle the toggle first video, please. Excellent, and here we go. Thank yep. you. As you can see, uh, the, um, the, that roller coaster is the world's fastest. It goes from zero to 240 kilometers an hour in four seconds to replicate the experience of driving a Formula One car. And as you can see, the, uh, the drivers were very familiar with the experience. Starting in uh, September of 2007, I led, uh, I, I led the I led the uh, direction uh, of, uh, of this whole project, uh, including visioning, 
strategic and master planning, consumer research, financial analysis, design, and delivered. And we completed this very complex building in just three short years, officially opening it in October of 2010. Under my direction, our team of 400 architects, engineers, and RISE experts oversaw the good work of over 5,000 workers. I arrived in Abu Dhabi in 2007 when the site was just flat sand in the Sahara Desert with only a simple concept agreed upon to create it. We followed the usual steps to create a world-class project. We began with visioning, including all members of our team, as well as the ultimate asset managers and operators, to ensure we delivered the most operationally perfect project we could. The operator, operators knew where the doors were supposed to go after all. <laughs> Next, the same team contributed their respective expertise to the strategic and master planning of the project. With the detailed roadmap we created, we knew we were on the right track. But first, we needed to test the concept and to refine it with our world audience by performing our consumer research. After all, this was the first example in the world of a Ferrari world uh, park. As a consumer psychologist, I reached out to all of the major metropolitan markets within seven flying hours of Abu Dhabi so we could learn what our future customers wanted us to be for them. Through focus groups, surveys, and interviews, we learned the answer to that question. They universally wanted us to share with them the authentic Ferrari experience. Then we performed many different financial analyses, evaluating all cases from best to worst. We developed a very detailed risk mitigation strategy to ensure we were ready to deal with everything we believe would be thrown at us, and then some. Moving ahead with concept design, then schematic, and lastly, final design, our very talented team of architects and ride designers worked out the complex integrated design we needed to deliver. Our quantity surveyors were involved at every step of the way to ensure we knew what we needed to budget to achieve that goal and to carry the proper contingencies to do so. Lastly, our delivery team worked hard with their planners throughout the process with our quali quality surveyors along for every step of the way also to ensure we provided the best possible expression of the owner's vision. Together, our team provided the authentic Ferrari experience. committed to doing this on a 24-7, 365 schedule. So what that means is that there isn't a moment when there isn't something progressive being done on this site. The different parts of the Ferrari world are the two big roller coasters. And these are very fast. Ferrari World is uh, an exciting uh, project. Uh, the actual physical structure is, of course, exciting. It's 2.2 uh, million square feet, uh, approximately 200,000 square meters in size, which makes it the world's largest indoor theme park. We uh, rigorously applied agile project management values, principles, and systems to great effect. And the following video shows the final result. Next video, please.
Thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, that you have to realize is that uh, uh, our secret sauce uh, was agile project management. Using this system resulted in us being on time and on budget for an extremely complex project, one that we were almost inventing as we went along. My team and I earned an exemplary performance rating and the in-person congratulations of the Crown Prince of the UAE, His Royal Highness Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan, as you can see in the picture. Um, I can tell you that uh, we we're very, very proud of this. By using our form of agile project management systems, supported by advanced prop tech applications such as Primavera P6, every team member was integrated into our active information sharing and all were invited to contribute their ideas as we progressed. Now let's talk uh, specifics. What is Agile? Agile is a mentality, an iterative and adaptive approach to managing projects. It, uh, it involves breaking down projects into smaller and more manageable chunks of effort and focus, referred to as sprints, generally scheduled in one to two week increments. As a result, teams are more transparent and can accommodate frequent inspection and adaptation. And adaptation is that key word, especially in today's environment, a very, uh, very high tempo activity. So what are its goals? As applied to property development, the goal of agile project management is to help teams deliver value faster and more efficiently, crucial in today's, uh, today's environment. And, and one of the things that uh, we need to always remember is that to put it into effect, these are principles, I now wanna describe what its methodology is. Fundamentally, it is based upon the words iterate and repeat. Based on the Agile Manifesto, which is underpinning the system, and its core values, Agile Project Manager Management is a piece-by-piece -piece approach to project development, as opposed to traditional waterfall project management systems. Firstly, you have to assume, you have to understand what its background is. <clears throat> it was originated in the aerospace industry back in, the, uh, in the, the times of the uh, moon launches and so on. And it migrated into use by software engineers and the software developers. Then in the early 2000s, it began to be considered for project management of properties such as uh, we applied in our case. So we were uh, at an early stage and we developed our own system uh, to, uh, to be, be able to use it effectively. So we need to talk about its values. Agile manifesto values are that agile users value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Number two, we value works that function over comprehensive documentation. Number three, we value customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And lastly, we value response to change over following a set plan. So from the word itself, Agile, you can determine that f flexibility is a fundamental part of it. Now I'd like to talk about the specifics. There are 12 Agile principles, and I'll begin. And I'm gonna give some examples as we go along. Please remember them because later in our question and answer period, I'd be happy to address any thoughts you have about the application of this system to your particular circumstances. So principle number one, the highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous development. Agile principles encourage the minimizing of the time between ideation and application. So how does this play out? 
If our highest priority is to satisfy the client through timely and continuous delivery, we have to set up to do that. Agile principles encourage the minimizing of the time between ideation and application. We fast-tracked our work to stay on schedule, and our daily meetings were used to review, review our current status and any changes that were implemented. Don't forget, we delivered this massive project in just three years, from the time I saw it as flat sand in the desert to the time when we had our guests riding on that uh, roller coaster that you saw. Principle number two. In the world around us, change is the only constant. How often have we heard that? Well, if we've heard it often enough, then we should respond to it. And in fact, principle number two does. Agile principles and values support responding to these changes rather than moving forward despite them. We welcomed changing needs, even late in development. Agile processes harness change for the client's advantage. We cost-effectively handled over 800 design change orders. That's a massive number, isn't it? The need for those was created by the revolutionary design of the building. Like I told you, we were inventing it often as we went. But because we allocated sufficient contingency, a financial one, these weekly events uh, were uh, instrumental in our, our ability to, uh, to avoid, uh, avoid confusion. Our weekly meetings were signified by our calm analysis of the items in question. Quick remedies were devised and exhaustively analyzed by our quantity surveyors to contain the cost. And we then implemented them after we came to agreement with the various uh, delivery uh, elements such as our subcontractors. As a result, we controlled our claims process with a disciplined discipline approach, including thorough documentation. At the end of the project, we saved $180 million in claims by our rigorous control of the design change orders. Design change orders, unfortunately, are an inevitable part of any development. We've all experienced them. Maybe not 801 project, but we've all experienced them. And it won't surprise you to learn that uh, a general contractor in our today's environment relies upon 10 to 15 percent of their bottom line profit on the upgrades that they offer and get agreed by the client. So by maintaining this control process I described, <clears throat> we ended up avoiding having any misunderstandings, shall we call them, between ourselves and contractors to ensure that at the end of the project we weren't going to find surprises. And in fact, we did not. So the next uh, principle that, that we're going to uh, look at is principle number three. <clears throat> Deliver work frequently in packages from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to the shorter time scale. We designed and built using these integrated packages. We found that building with more frequent mini releases of our updated design and follow on work sped up the project's overall development pace. Principle number four, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. That means they are executives and technical staff. And so we, were, we had a very joined up and integrated team. A typical day was senior management. We would meet at the site daily to review progress and examine any problems to arrive at, at uh, immediate solutions. Remember, Using our PropTech uh, advantage with Primavera P6, we had been inputting all of our commodities costs, all of our labor costs the night before, so that in the morning when my team and I walked in on the dashboard of myself and my senior project managers, of whom I had four, was the S-curve that we were following. And, and we were able to see whether or not there was any variation in terms of our expected delivery of time as well as our budget. So that powerful technology helped us to ask the right questions. So we went out to the site, we saw all of that, and we we responded to it. And we came back to the uh, to our office, worked on the solutions, next day, repeat. Every team member was also at the at a table weekly, every team member, and we were all connected 
daily, including the asset and project managers who were there to nurture the building from handover. Remember, these are the guys who know where the doors go. <laughs> Communication is a critical component of any project or team success. And agile principles essentially mandate that it's a daily event. I ensured everyone was in my email group, so no one was excluded from all two-way communications. No secrets, no silos. Principle number five, build projects around motivated individuals. How often have we heard this? People are the most important ingredient and our most important asset. So give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get this job done. Everyone on the team had visibility and their opinions were all valued, benefiting everyone with their unique cultural uh, backgrounds. One of the things I will come to in a minute is, when I assembled our team, I had access to professionals internationally, worldwide. And on our team, we had 14 different nationalities. All of them contributed in a very meaningful way. And we were the beneficiaries of some great, uh, great, uh, great you know, results as a result of that. So, I ensured that we, our team operated on a first names basis only. As well, I didn't permit any private offices, including for me. And I insisted on the first name usage to ensure everyone was afforded easy access to each other for the most efficient sharing of information. Even the Indian tea boys used to call me Mr. Phil. <laughs> Everybody was on the same page. A key part of the Agile philosophy is empowering individuals and teams through trust and autonomy. The Agile team needs to be carefully built to include the right people and skill sets to get the job done. And responsibilities need to be clearly defined before the beginning of a project. Once the work has begun, however, there's no place in Agile for micromanagement or handholding. Very important to remember. So trust is the underpinnings of the success of the application of Agile. But frankly, it is as well for Waterfall, but particularly so with Agile. Principle number six, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. Effective communication with all of the professionals mean, mean, meant getting these conversations out of email and favored more face-to-face -face human interaction, even if done by video conference calls, as it was a necessity because we were tapping into people outside of the immediate team who were internationally located. Because of my willingness to listen to anybody who wanted to discuss anything with me, Remember, I was visible, I was in an open concept. People were free to walk up, call me by my first name, and share their concerns and ideas. As a result, I had longer days than most, but I was rewarded with an excellent understanding of what was happening at any given time. As well, I generated regular celebrations of our gains, making sure that the professionals responsible for them were acknowledged. These are all very important considerations. And of course, it wasn't just a two-way, uh, one-way interaction. I invited people to come to, to see me in all the ways I described, but I literally would put out summonses to people to come and come and see me so we could discuss them in small groups as well as individually. And again, they presented me with ideas, honestly, I would never have had by myself. And it, it came from their a particular approach due to their cultures and due to their work experiences internationally. A very, very valuable uh, process and one that we and most ultimately the client benefited from. So now we want to want to talk about principle number seven. Works that function are the primary measure of progress. Well, I guess that sounds kind of obvious, i.e. what you see is what you get. But our daily site inspections ensured we were satisfied with the quality and functionality of the works, reducing any backtracking to a minimum. In addition to that, every week we also cross-checked other project elements, such as the hotels, of which there were seven we were constructing, the Formula One racetrack, which was right next door, 
and led by another Canadian, and the marina, which accommodates uh, vessels with uh, up to uh, 250 uh, meters, if you can imagine it. Those are big ships. <laughs> so what we did was by inspecting them and reporting to their directors any improvements we saw or insights we gained through those daily inspections of their project elements, we helped them improve. The ultimate measurement for success is a working project that your clients love. Very often, we would find that shortcuts have been taken by our subcontractors. And we, of course, ordered corrective action for which they had to cover the costs. But think about the human cost here. I can tell you that out of 50 million man hours worked to create this project over three years, we experienced two fatalities. Now, you often hear about the uh, record not necessarily that good in the Middle East, uh, Qatar being the latest example, where literally many, many people have lost their lives. Well, maybe it's our Canadian way of doing things, but I refuse to accept that as a given. And so as a result, um, one of the fatalities was someone who unfortunately committed suicide. Another was one of the abseilers who was working at height at the 50 meter level, uh, just under deck, and didn't tie off properly and fell to his death. But imagine that, two fatalities during that entire project. So how did we get there? Well, again, on our daily inspections, what I would make sure to do that my team and I, we would be watchful for exceptions being made, especially working at heights, although we didn't catch that one. And that meant that what we would do is if we saw anybody working uh, more than a meter off the floor without being tied off, we immediately stop work, some of their foremen and make sure that they were tied off and continue to be. Eventually we trained them very well so that they, they didn't have to see us coming to know what we were going to say. But that's the byproduct, uh, as I say, of the kind of vigilance that we applied to this situation. If we hadn't done that, uh, I would have a different story to tell, but I am most proud of the fact that we had such a wonderful safety record and it was, it was something that we had to work very hard to succeed with. Then agile principle number eight. Agile processes uh, pro promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Our tight team integration ensured overall coherence and promoted a fast pace of work. Agile principles encourage us to be mindful of sustainable development and to set realistic, clear expectations and then to meet them. The idea is to keep morale high and improve work-life balance to prevent burnout and turnover among members of our cross-functional teams. Within the village that we had uh, established on the island, a workers' village, we accommodated 48,000 workers, 48,000 from different nationalities. And unlike what you've heard stories about in the Middle East, they occupied uncrowded air-conditioned space. Don't forget, day, daytime temperatures and sometimes nighttime in the Middle East in the summer months can exceed um, 55 and 60 degrees. So you have to look after uh, people's safety by giving them a platform from which they can work comfortably. In fact, we had indoor uh, exercise facilities, outdoor soccer pitches, football, that, uh, that they used, again, to maintain their mental health, basically, and their positive attitude towards working on Ferrari World. So these are, these are all important considerations that went into how we succeeded with uh, Ferrari World. And I'm not preaching, I'm simply saying that as a Canadian, I led a team that was very mindful of HSE and very mindful of the value of our greatest asset, humans. So agile principles encourage us to be mindful of sustainable development and to set clear expectations. I've told you that, but I want to repeat it because you've got to be able to share with people what your goals are so that they can, in fact, buy into it. During the last six months of the project, I was present every day, seven days a week. Since I needed the team to work at an accelerated pace, 
I felt I couldn't ask them to work that hard if I wasn't prepared to do so as well. And even though I missed uh, my time off, um, we basically cycled through and we were working 24 seven during that last six months, 24 seven, to be able to achieve the pace that, that was needed to meet, meet the goal. And our goal was very simply, we had to be ready for the Formula One race that was the inaugural race uh, for uh, for the uh, UAE, and we did so uh, for 2010. We did so um, with the knowledge that 400 million people were going to be seeing on TV the results of our efforts, <laughs> as well as the results of our colleagues' efforts in building the Formula One racetrack. So we knew that we had, uh, a, you know, not just a tight timetable, but a very rigid and specific one that we had to meet. And Agile was the method by which we were able to achieve that. I'll move on to principle number nine. Continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Constant oversight by our quality assurance and quantity surveyor teams ensured we were able to identify the best solutions and to implement them cost effectively. While the Agile philosophy encourages shorter cycles and frequent changes, it also puts emphasis on the importance of keeping things neat and tidy, well organized and shared, so they don't cause problems in the future, either in our current project then or our future ones. So we built up a knowledge base that was a, became a, a cultural knowledge that, uh, that we maintain for our future projects. We also uh, minimized the board of work by maintaining full transparency and 360 degree visibility by all concerned. We eliminated the silos that so often accompany projects and business organizations. Constant oversight by our quality assurance and quantity surveyor teams ensured we were able to identify the best solutions and to implement them cost effectively. I'd like to move on to principle number 10. Don't worry, we've only got three more to go. Principle number 10 is simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. It's very essential. What we did was we, we made sure that we uh, eliminated the silos, as I mentioned, but that we maintained control over any abortive work. But we also applied the 80-20 rule. The concept that you can usually get 80% of your intended results with just 20% of the work. Agile principles encourage thinking this way, doing the things that can have the most impact. And don't we all want to be doing those? And don't we all not want to be doing a board of work? Principle number 11, we're in the home stretch. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. We formed ad hoc teams, which were encouraged to handle challenges as they emerged. Agile principles suggest the use of self-organizing teams, which will work in a more flatter, uh, flat management style. And you could tell I'm a big advocate of that. Where decisions are made as a group, rather than by a singular manager or, or a management team. So I was always a part of those groups and always participating, but they shifted in terms of their contact content depending on what was it, what it was that we were doing at any given moment. Principle number 12, we're almost there. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. We regularly reviewed our team progress in detail and recorded our lessons learned for later follow-up and reference. There was no place for, we can't change because we've always done it this way. Just like we're always learning new things uh, about our project and client, we're also learning from the processes we're using to learn those things. Agile is not about following a strictly defined process for every sprint and release. It's about continuous improvement. Agile project management values and systems made possible the design and delivery of Ferrari World and the YAS Super Regional Mall in just 36 months on budget and on schedule from vision to handover. 
here's a summary of, uh, of what we've learned. Our high level obs observations and conclusions. We created a flat organization that was emblematic of Agile. We used an open concept office based on ready access to all involved, facilitated by the use of first names only to reduce cultural communications barriers. I didn't mean to imply that I was the only guy who was so lucky as to hear from everybody. <laughs> My senior project managers follow the same practice and principle, and so they too heard from other members of, uh, of the team. But we all shared the, shared the results. That was driven in part by the fact that in the open concept office and location I occupied, around me were all my senior project managers. And I heard what they heard. And so, you know, there was a constant participation in the, in the ebb and flow of the project. Number two, we ensured all voices were fully heard and everyone was engaged with one another, communicating daily as a standard practice to make that point. We used the power of Primavera P6, one of the many PropTech innovations that we use, and I'm a big believer in PropTech. In fact, I sit on a board of directors in a uh, US-based uh, PropTech firm to this day, and I was a PropTech uh, pioneer. 30 years ago, I originated a management and information system that was accommodated on computers, and I sold and distributed it and installed it with my team across North America. So I've always been a huge believer in the value of technology. Primavera P6, on account of the daily updates that we had in terms of the inputs, and then this output being the schedule and budget progress, it became, it was the technology foundation that allowed us to navigate a very complex program and to deliver it on time. You can see how important that is, knowledge. Lastly, our quantity surveyor teams daily cost analysis, and our quality assurance team's regular testing ensured the viability and integration of all the moving parts as efficiently and reliably as possible. Not in North America so much, but rather uh, in the outside world, uh, starting with Great Britain, the, there's a system of, uh, of quality assurance called Clerks of the Works. These are very experienced journeymen who are in the industry who not only uh, are the sole, um, pardon me, who have as their sole audience the owner, as the as I was the owner's representative, but what they do is they go out on the project and they also see, through walking around, improvements that can be made at the coal face. In other words, if a worker is not doing something as efficiently as possible, they're uh, obliged to intervene and to help them understand how better to conduct the particular work they're doing. And of course, as very experienced people, they understood exactly what that meant. So these are the quality assurances that, uh, that are built in that result in making sure all the nails are driven correctly, <laughs> all the nuts are, are basically tightened uh, to the degree possible and the rivets are installed correctly. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have had the resulting quality of the project, which the, which the owner uh, was insisting upon. So there are ways um, that are exemplified by international best practices that I myself have used that can help us in North America do a, to do a better job. And in fact, more and more of that is proliferating as more of our corporations work outside of North America and learn these various practices that I learned. I can tell you my uh, uh, my learning curve went straight up when I uh, when I was uh, the day I arrived in Abu Dhabi and never stopped as I migrated from there to India where I worked with Tata on several projects and then I moved to China and I worked on several projects there and we always remember the old adage that everything's big in Texas well the project I worked on first in China was 19 million square feet in size <laughs> in a city of 5 million people called Kunming. Later, I worked on a project and led the development of a seven level uh, shopping center, five levels underground, two above, integrated with uh, a, a 11 million uh, person uh, concert uh, convention uh, facility across the street and with two subway stops. So, you know, these kinds of experiences really teach us a lot about what the possibilities are and allow us to exercise our imagination outside of what our usual box is, shall we say. Beautiful, isn't it? 
it's a pretty uh, pretty great uh, pretty great picture. Uh, and uh, you'll notice the shopping center in the background. In the foreground, this green space I have take particular pride in. Is one day I was looking at it when I first arrived on the plans, and I asked myself, what are we going to do in there? We've got roller coasters in the other two apexes, but nothing there. What you can't see is across the street is the Formula One racetrack. Well, I reason, well, because this is an integrated process, you know, the construction of these different elements, why don't we put a concert venue in there? Another Canadian was working uh, on behalf of the Abu Dhabi government as the director of entertainment. I invited him down and we had a look at it together. And I said, you know, I, I want to put an entertainment space here. I think we can hold up to 40,000 people. And he says, he kind of looked at me quizzically uh, at the time because, of course, we, we were looking at flat sand. And I said to him, I'm sure we can do this. He agreed. I got approval from our board of directors and we created this space. During the inaugural Formula One race in uh, the fall of 2010, we had four concerts there. Beyonce was the first, Jamiroquois was the second, the Kings of Leon were the third, and Air Supply was the fourth. 40,000 people every night filled that space and enjoyed the entertainment as an integral part of the Formula One weekend that we produced. So I'm proud to say that uh, I was able to be uh, helpful uh, uh, in the design in terms of the final effect of these of these projects. And that's something you must always maintain a perspective of. You've got to make sure you understand what it is you're trying to achieve and what are the possibilities. And that was an example of that. The result is you will notice today that virtually every Formula One race that is held it comes with an entertainment venue of some kind. So I, uh, as a big Formula One fan, I was happy to make that contribution to the sport. <laughs> and uh, on the evening of the Beyonce concert, my friend uh, and I were standing having a beer. Yeah, you can drink in certain places in Abu Dhabi and at the halftime of uh, Beyonce show. And he says, you know, honestly, Phil, when I heard you first tell your story about what you thought was possible, I pretty much thought you were cry crazy, <laughs> but here we are. So not so crazy. And, you know, the beauty of, of this, of this uh, development, which we completed again, in just 36 months on budget and on schedule, is this uh, only a part of its response to our customers' desire for Ferrari authenticity. Uh, in conclusion, Ferrari World is more than just an amusement park. It is a celebration of the Ferrari brand's heritage and innovation, and a unique way to experience the thrill of driving a Ferrari, something not everybody is uh, able to do. Happily, I was on the on the Formula One racetrack, but a, a regular streetcar. It is the manifestation of a trillion-dollar brand. Ferrari is a trillion-dollar brand. And it had to be exactly what the client wanted. I hope you enjoyed learning how my team and I helped bring it to life. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Phil. I appreciate that. Um, everybody, if you can uh, enter your questions, any questions that you might have right into the chat window or the questions tab on the web interface. Um, go ahead and just enter them now. Type your questions into the chat window or the web inter or the uh, the questions window on the web interface. Obviously, if you're listening to this on the recording on YouTube, uh, it's a little too late. Uh, okay, first question coming in. Janie asked a question. I, I believe it's Janie would be a she. I apologize if I'm misgendering. Uh, Janie asked. Um, what about multicultural delivery? Did you have problems building a team across multiple cultures? That's a great question, Jamie. Thank you very much for asking it. Um, you know, that was something on my mind, obviously, when I went to Abu Dhabi, but it was, it was made more possible because the language of business in the Middle East is English, and that's due to its heritage. Uh, the a couple of centuries, uh, first the British uh, involvement and as well as other uh, nationalities, but English became the language of, uh, of business. And as a result, we basically were able to communicate well. Helped by that in included uh, the fact that, for example, the Indian uh, and Pakistani 
uh, workers um, had English uh, trained them in their education. Uh, also, the Filipinos were well trained in, in uh, speaking English. So our communications, although we had to be careful to avoid misunderstandings, those communications were made possible by that fact, and and we succeeded as a result. As I say, I can't I can't overemphasize the need for efficient communications, and I I always remember uh, to listen as well as I uh, as well as to speak. So <laughs> I'll stop speaking now. <laughs> Any other questions, uh, Kevin? Excellent, thank you. Um, we had somebody who wants to uh, issue a compliment, not a question. Uh, that was from Adam. Adam, is there a specific compliment you want to make or just generally send compliments? Uh, you can go ahead, just type it in the chat window again or the questions window. Well, Adam is doing that. There's another question. Uh, this one's coming from Mohammed, who's asking, what about procurement uh, in the in Abu Dhabi? Um, Mohammed, I'm trying to I'm trying to summarize a long question, so apologize. Uh, says uh, there's a lot of issues around procurement in the Middle East, specifically around um, incentive payments to ensure on time delivery. How did you handle this issue? Well, thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Mohammed. I appreciate your question. Yes, uh, definitely, uh, there are issues not not just in the Middle East, but in uh, India and in China, where I uh, worked as well. But I can tell you that um, transparency is very important. In other words, sharing with uh, all contributors, including uh, those who uh, provide uh, the equipment, uh, the commodities, and so on, as well as the labor to produce the project. Um, sharing with them a clear understanding and a detailed understanding of not only what it is that uh, we uh, were doing, but when we were going to do it so that they could prepare for that. And it was incumbent on us to make sure that uh, we issued our purchase orders in a timely fashion with long enough lead times respecting the various uh, specialties that we were dealing with. A good example is uh, the roller coasters. These are highly specialized pieces of equipment, and as you can appreciate, safety is a, is a key ingredient within it. So the reliability uh, of the providers had to be measured by us uh, first and foremost. Once we were satisfied uh, with that, we issued scope. We provided them with a thorough understanding of what was required and on what timetable. And as a result, although it wasn't perfect, uh, generally speaking, we uh, had compliance insofar as the delivery of these uh, various ingredients. Now, I can tell you it wasn't uh, the case that we didn't scramble at times when uh, unforeseen uh, events uh, intervened in the, in the receipt of these uh, various ingredients. Uh, but nonetheless, we made our way through. And I th again, I attribute our success to, in doing so to Agile because we had a we had that mindset that's remember what agility is we had that mindset that allowed us to think about the other possibilities we had a risk mitigation strategy on which we put our worst nightmares <laughs> lack of delivery being one of them uh, so that we were able to ensure that um, we knew what we were going to do in the event that such and such a, a risk be manifested itself so again although it wasn't perfect our agile system and the means by which we impl implemented it were such that we could respond to those. Remember, we had promised His Royal Highness, Highness that we would have this ready for delivery prior to the Formula One race. This was a hugely uh, important event in the Middle East and uh, went to the issue of ensuring uh, that, you know, their pride was uh, properly maintained, that they believed they showed the world and we did that collectively we could pr produce a world-class effect and happily we did that so i hope that answers your question i i don't claim perfection but i do say that we had the backup plans in place to be able to navigate through those particular challenges that uh, inevitably arise not just in the middle east but elsewhere as well i hope that answers your question Excellent. Uh, I did finally get the, uh, the the compliment from um, 
Adam, and it appears that Adam might have been one of your past team members. It says, yeah. Phil led us well. I can vouch for harnessing change to add competitive value, building self-performing teams around motivated individuals, transparency, tuning and adjusting our approach continuously. I think the concert venue came up with was a result of, uh, was a result of collaborative out-of-the-box thinking, which enhanced the value greatly for Ferrari World. Thanks, thanks for that, Adam. And definitely, Adam was a very integral part of our team. And uh, no, I didn't pay him for that compliment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, uh, but I, I'm willing to. <laughs> no, actually, uh, Adam was an important member of our team and uh, very valuable. And what uh, Adam did, again, he embraced this the agile mentality that uh, we used. And we knew we could trust and rely upon one another. I think an important consideration is that you've really got to leave your ego at home when you do these sorts of projects. And humility is an extremely important value that uh, has to be delivered. Because I asked, my, asked everyone to call me by my first name, it helped remind me that I'm, I was just one team member. And I had a job to do. Uh, my job was to lead the team, but that didn't mean I was in any way better or superior to them. Everybody was treated fairly and equally on, on team. And today we see the need for that being expressed with uh, various DEI principles, diversity, equity, and inclusion that are incorporated in companies' plans today. And we incorporated those plans right from the beginning. And happily, I'm say, I, I can say that, uh, uh, you know, as a Canadian, it's some, it's, these are principles that we embrace and we're, we're the beneficiaries of it. Thank you very much for the compliment, Adam, uh, and may I compliment you on your fine contribution as well. Thank you. Next uh, question was from Faisal. Faisal said, what's the biggest mistake you made on the project and what did you learn from that? Mistake? What? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, uh, let me go to my list. <laughs> I would say that uh, probably it was that I didn't come ready-made to lead the project. I learned how to do it as through practice. So you saw an earlier video where uh, I was talking about the project on site. And, you know, you go, you go through a, a list of learnings in your life. Uh, so as an example, in a regional shopping center project that I had uh, helped to uh, create, I led the development of and the operation of it. Um, I learned through bitter experience through seeing one of our pe people fall who were not tied off properly as they tried to climb what was the artificial Christmas tree <laughs> to essentially put it in place. And that man, uh, who's a friend of mine, uh, he suffered leg injuries that prevented him from ever working again. So it's those kinds of experiences that you suffer. And it was my mistake, <clears throat> you know, that I didn't uh, anticipate <clears throat> the safety requirements. Well, I didn't make that mistake again. So it's more a matter of going through these processes <clears throat> and making sure that you learn. Noted that I said in one of our principles, we recorded history. In other words, we talked about what it was that was good and bad about what we might have achieved in the week prior. And we uh, we basically memorialize that for reference by others. So as you go through these experiences, you gather um, more knowledge, you gather more ways of doing things that make you and future teams better. Um, the other uh, mistakes we might have made included um, not uh, properly <clears throat> understanding all of the integrated service requirements that we had. And through, unfortunately, scrambling, we managed to overcome those underground service installations, but we did so in a way that happily saved the day. But again, had I anticipated that complexity ahead of time, uh, I, I could have avoided that mistake. You can depend on the fact that's one of the memorialized uh, lessons learned. And then the sharing of these lessons learned as we're doing today, <clears throat> I'm only sorry, I can't interact with you all in person. Um, I'd like to hear what your lessons learned are as we all should share. Okay, excellent. Uh, one last question and then I have a comment, uh, a couple of comments So, uh, from somebody. So the, the last question, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. We can't take any more questions, but the, uh, the last question here is from 
uh, Ahmad Shah, who says, how can we make developers aware of these advanced delivery methods here in North America? What has been done so far? Well, um, I uh, lead a consultancy uh, of uh, 18 subject matter experts called Black Opal Property Advisors, Inc. And we offer not only uh, consultancy to, to help developers um, under, learn and understand and how to apply these principles, but we also, uh, some of our team members provide training. And so as a result, uh, you know, there, there are people like us, uh, we're not alone, who, are, who have had these international experiences, who've learned from them, and I think uh, you know it's incumbent on us. It's our responsibility to our to our uh, our industry to share them with others. So, as an example, uh, I'm a, an author along with my wife, who's a very uh, skillful uh, corporate trainer, um, with uh, the uh, the contribution of 16 other subject matter experts. We wrote a book called Vertical Villages. The Magic of Mixed-Use Development. It was published last year. It's available on Amazon. And what we do is, in it, we describe the experiences of, of people, all of whom had 30 years of experience on average uh, through, the, uh, through this industry in all different uh, areas and for all different property classes. And so this book has become a textbook. Uh, it's available in the Urban Land Institute's uh, bookstore as well. And it, uh, it basically is a, uh, a, a DIY or how to uh, apply the lessons learned that we gathered over our careers. So, you know, there, we're just one example. There are many other smart people out there who have the, these lessons learned to offer. And, uh, you know, I highly recommend that we, um, as developers, overcome our uh, egos <laughs> to learn what these uh, global best practices are <clears throat> and to incorporate them in our everyday everyday lives. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, there's another comment here from Adam who says, um, lessons learned? He said, cultural intelligence matters. People have different motivators. Do you care to comment on that? Gosh, that's a big subject. <clears throat> I would have to say, and Adam was a beneficiary of this as well as myself, um, again, those 14 different nationalities whom we attracted, you know, all have their own uniqueness. And there's no one perfect culture by any means. And so the filtration of those ideas by the other, mem other members of the team who came from different cultures, the filtration of those ideas helped to make them more applicable to our particular situation. Inevitably, there, there's going to be cultural differences. Uh, I have my foibles just like everybody does, so uh, by no means proclaiming that we have all the received wisdom, we don't. Instead, what I, what I would am fast to proclaim is that we need to listen, we need to invite, we need to value, so that we get the participation of these different cultures and we need to learn what their characteristics are and filter them so that we can come to a conclusion that is most effectively applied in a given project or situation. Excellent, thank you very much. We're out of time for questions, everybody, but I do appreciate those of you who took time to enter comments or questions to the chat window. I'll make sure they all get back to uh, Phil, so he gets uh, all of your all of your feedback. So thank you very much, everybody. This was great. I learned a lot, Phil. Thank you for your time. I just want to remind everybody, if you do want to get a hold of Phil, you can do so at uh, his email address or website, uh, Black Opal uh, Property Advisors. He mentioned that earlier. Or uh, if you're watching this on the recorded video, there'll be contact information following uh, the conclusion of these comments. You'll see uh, contact information where you can get a hold of Phil through Procept Associates, who's sponsoring this call. Uh, just wanted to point out our upcoming uh, webinar. The next one's on May 3rd, setting up a PMO, wow them in 100 days. On May 10th, building quality and construction projects. And we have more roughly every two weeks throughout the year. So wherever you heard about this webinar, uh, please keep your eyes open. You'll find registration options for all of the upcoming free webinars we're going to be posting throughout the year. Phil, I, thank I, you. I, one, one thing to add, if I may, uh, Kevin, I'd like to uh, amplify that uh, Procept uh, Associates is very, very competent in the provision of uh, 
uh, training and uh, consultancy for agility. And in fact, uh, we have a, a joint venture between us by which we combine to be able to give the best of each of our strengths to do so. So uh, Procept uh, is a, a very capable organization and uh, Kevin leading it is one of the most noted uh, agility experts in North America. Thank you very much for the plug, Phil. Yes, all of our training is accredited. Uh, we do training through uh, for the um, uh, Mechanical Contracting Education Council. Uh, we do for their project management training. Our, our training is accredited by the Canadian Construction Association, uh, AACE, PMI, we're PMI authorized training providers, and many other relevant accreditations and certifications in the construction space. Okay, well, thank you very much for the time. Um, Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.